for those of you who weren't here a few minutes ago, we're going to try and get you to answer some questions as we go along. You need to um, log on to the wireless network that says Gresham College, and then in the URL space of your browser, type glsr.it stroke Gresham, and then there should be some questions um, which you can answer. And um, in a moment or two, I'll press the space bar and see if we get some answers up. OK, thank you. Right, well, let's, um, could you put my slide projector on from here? My computer onto the screen? Thank you. So this is the first question that those of you who logged on should have had. And so far, uh, those of you who voted think that, oh, it's just changing. 63 of you think you should make the decisions about your health care, and uh, it's two thirds, one third, basically, think that the doctor should make the decisions. This is before we start, and it's shifting around quite quickly. Don't know whether that's because I'm a doctor. <laughs> OK, so here's the next question that I hope will now be on your browsers. So if you can vote, and um, we'll give it a couple more minutes for you to vote. At the end of all of this, we will have um, all of these results we'll put into the presentation that goes on the web in due course when they're a bit more um, secure. Gresham. Yeah. I'll give you one more minute because I've got one more minute before I'm due to t speak. <laughs> okay. So, almost all of you have used some of these uh, ratings and review. Um, advisory sites in order to um, book a question, book something. So, okay. So you, I was told earlier on that it's impossible to uh, start a Gresham talk without mentioning Kierkegaard, but he has a particularly um, good quote in this context. <laughs> that the most important human activity that you can make is decision-making because it's through the choices that you make that we create our lives and become ourselves. Um, and we've done the first question. So uh, I'm here to talk today about how to choose a doctor, and I've subtitled it slightly differently from your program to Whatever Happened to Patient Choice? And it's a bit different, as you can see tonight, because we're scoring. You're going to be able to join in. And secondly, uh, because I'm going to be joined by Neil Bacon, who's sitting in the front row, who's a, a colleague and a renal physician, who's got a passion for um, finding out what patients' views are and how they might change healthcare. Um, and I hope that you will um, enjoy that. And at the end, we're going to try and give you a little bit more time to answer questions than the usual, because this, this is about choices. The essay that goes with this is, uh, contains a lot more detail than we're going to cover in the talk tonight. And uh, I also want to thank Rose. Uh, this is uh, Rose Thompson, who is a philosopher and a, a Gresham audience member who's here tonight, who's been incredibly helpful in doing a lot of research background uh, for this talk. And we'll thank you, Rose, for all that work. Uh, making choices is important. We do it all the time. Uh, sometimes we call it voting. Sometimes we decide to go and eat in a particular restaurant. You'll all, I hope, turn out for the EU referendum in due course, making a choice. Making choice in healthcare is much more difficult, even for doctors. So although we think that we might have inside knowledge, in fact, what we do when we make choices for ourselves is very often to fall back on recommendations from colleagues and reputation. And as you'll see, that may or may not be the best way of doing things. The choices you have to make in healthcare are, in, in essence, relatively simple. What treatment do you want? Who do you want to give it to you, provide it? 
when do you want it, when do you want your appointment, and um, where do you want it done, which provider, which hospital, which GP, which practice. And actually, I want to ask you some questions. Do you want to make a choice? Can you make a choice? How do you make a choice in healthcare? And where are the data that would allow you to make a rational choice? And these are some of the issues that we're going to cover tonight, together with this question. Do you really want to, or should we just trust the doctor to make the decision for you? So is choice important? Um, and the first thing to realize is that um, healthcare is not particularly uniform in its provision or quality throughout the country. And so I'm going to hand over to Neil, as I said, whose passion this is, who's just going to um, talk about this topic. Neil. Thank you. I think it's um, interesting that many people would wish they didn't have to make a choice, perhaps. Sorry, you can't hear me? It's the microphone. Is that OK? OK. So thank you, Martin. Maybe that many of us wish we didn't have to make a choice, but it's interesting. The evidence is clear that there's considerable variation in quality and safety across not just our healthcare system, but indeed across every healthcare system in the world. What does that mean, and is it important to you? Well, here are just a few examples. There is a fourfold variation in the urgent cancer referral rate across England depending on which GP practice you are registered with. What does that actually mean? It means that, um, according to the National Audit Office, the government's own independent watchdog, potentially 10,000 people die unnecessarily due to the variation, i.e. depending on which GP practice you're registered with. We also know that there's a fourfold variation in getting to a stroke unit in less than four hours. If you or a member of your family have a stroke, you want to get to a stroke unit in less than four hours. But there's a huge variation, a variation that perhaps wouldn't be tolerated in many other safety-critical industries. Diabetes, one of the most common conditions and growing fast. The processes and outcomes of care for diabetes are very variable, such that the NHS itself, in its Atlas of Variation, which we'll talk about, suggests there's a five-fold variation in your risk of death or amputation depending on where you get your primary care. These aren't small factors. These are matters potentially of life and death. The NHS produces its own atlas of variation, which probably gives you a clue as to how serious this topic is. <laughs> and you can look at that, whether for stroke rates, uh, diabetes care, colonoscopy rates, to see whether... Your area is one of the good ones or one of the bad ones. So for the NHS to produce a publication, a website called The Atlas of Variation, which I wouldn't suggest you read at bedtime if you have a nervous disposition, <laughs> really does suggest that in some cases, perhaps many cases, exercising choice is really, really important for you and your family. Other examples, which perhaps we can talk about at the end, mortality after surgery depends on which hospital you're treated in. These are not small issues, and I think they, they affect everybody. So it's not an exaggeration to say that in some cases, making the right choices will really have impact on, on your lives and uh, the lives of the, of the people we love. Martin. Um, so, it, I'm not so tall. So the... Um, issue about how a choice can impact on a system is quite important. And for many uh, years, for most of the history of medicine, medicine has fun functioned as a market. Historically, you could see any doctor you wanted, where you wanted, um, as long as you had the money. If you could pay for it, you could see anyone. And actually, for most of the world, that remains the case. Uh, the m medicine is transactional. It's a business. Now, in a perfect market, you would have consumers who are well-informed and rational, that's you as patients, acting in your own best interest to choose which services to buy, from whom, in a way that maximizes your well-being or your happiness or utility or ut as, as a, a definition. 
And that works really well if you've got plenty of things to choose from, plenty of providers to provide you with competition, which will force down the prices and in, in, improve the services. Sadly, or perhaps not sadly, healthcare is not a perfect market. It doesn't function in that way. And the, some very nice work was done um, by the King's Fund in 2010 to try and describe what these differences, which they called market failures were, I'm not sure that's the right word, but uh, why the healthcare market was different. And here they are. Um, patients don't behave in the same way as consumers because, not unreasonably, you can't test the product you're going to buy before you have it. You can't go and have two operations in two different hospitals and see which one's better. It's not a good idea. Uh, it's difficult to obtain the right information because what we do is difficult. It's taken us years and years to learn it, so how can we expect you to know it so quickly? And then if you choose one treatment over another from a limited pool of resources, some other poor person may not be able to get their treatment as well. So there's a sort of rationing element. Um, because of that mismatch of information, it's quite hard to let the buyer beware. Um, we have imposed regulation on our healthcare markets in a way um, that happens in education as well. And we often use the doctor, as we implied in our first question, um, to make decisions for you. Doctors don't behave the same way as, uh, as um, providers either because we are regulated in how we get into it and we're not used to competition, in fact. Uh, we don't really function in a self-interested way, we hope, because we try and be altruistic about the work that we do, and the organisations we work for are often, or mostly, not driven by profit. Um, there are less providers in the market than there are uh, shops in the high street, and it's quite difficult to tell the difference between them because of how we function. However, it's not really a shock that over the last 30 years, choice has become a political issue. It, in fact, you could argue that right from the beginning of the NHS, choice was political, and John Appleby certainly takes that view. He said that the NHS was the very embodiment of choice because before its existence, poor people didn't have a choice. And suddenly they did. When the health service started in 1948, you suddenly could choose to have your own GP, your own dentist, and your own optician, and you could choose who they were. And um, by the time the Heath government came around in 1972, there was a new concept which emerged, which was patients were actually consumers. This had grown up during that time, and there was an ideological view uh, that you needed to um, get care as well from the private sector, because heaven only knows the private sector does everything better than the public sector. That was the ideological position. When Margaret Thatcher came to power, it was even more marked. And so there was a, a desire to give out more information and specifically to have choice over the time of your care, the place of your care, and what meals you wanted in hospital. Um, there was a bit of a crisis in the health service at the end of the 1980s, which you might remember. And Margaret Thatcher chaired a group, a small group of ministers, um, to apply market principles to healthcare and using the market to increase efficiency and reduce inequity between systems on the basis of choice, either of patients or referrers or providers. This was called the internal market, and I'll come back to that in a little while. Under the uh, Blair and Brown years, choice was also supported as a political concept. And they had cried, uh, created all sorts of uh, different aspects of choice in a very short time, uh, piloting choice approaches, particularly choose and book, so that you could have an electronic method of choosing where and when to have your hospital appointment, and then finally publishing a website called NHS Choices. Now, at roughly the same time, we all got very familiar, uh, as you saw from your first question today, the ratings system for... Um, uh, uh, buying things on Amazon, for example. And that wasn't the first breakthrough of consumerism we, in which the magazine and the Consumers Association comes from the 1950s. Amazon, not till 1994, TripAdvisor, 2000, and patient-related scoring systems as late as 2008, and the NHS uh, right up to 2010. So the 
the invasion of choice into healthcare, apart from in the private sector, has been quite late. Now, what that did was to release the genie of patient choice from the lamp. Hard to push genies back in. And it became a quite a significant feature of a lot of the debate during that time. Well, who knew there was an NHS constitution, by the way? Did anybody know there was one? I've got four hands I can see. This gives you some rights. The right to get appropriate information to help you make choices. The right to choose the organization or hospital and team where you have your first outpatient appointment. The right to information when there um, is a legal right to choose. You can choose your GP practice and, it comes as a surprise to many people, the GP within it. And you have a right to be involved in the decisions about your care. These are rights within the NHS constitution. So where are we now? Well, we have an internal market. It's also called the purchaser-provider split. And the purchasers are also called commissioners. And these are uh, people who have the money, basically. And they can buy care from people like me in hospitals or from other units. The commissioners who buy the care set the price or tariff and the volume of activity that we can do. This is not a conventional business market. And it, uh, there's another player in all of this called the Clinical Commissioning Group. There are 211 of these set up by Lansley in two, 2012. They develop from an idea called GP fund holding. So the GPs, because they know a lot about medicine, can hold the cash and choose, advise you and choose where to buy services from. In the current era, general practice has to be part of a CCG. And these guys hold 70% of the NHS commissioning budget, which is about 70 billion pounds. It's not surprising that they can influence or limit your choice. So given that you can choose a GP, and given that it's so critical, as you saw from what Neil presented, to know where and what quality services you're going to get, how are you going to make a choice of which GP to go to? Well, we need some hypothetical illness. I'm getting quite old, so the idea of prostate trouble creeps up on me. Uh, not yet. But if I had an enlarged prostate and I arrived in a new area, how would I know which GP to go to? Would I choose a practice which was old and established, or would I fancy a nice modern one with plenty of seats, or one that was popular with the local people but I could never get an appointment? And if I did manage to get a general practice, which of these nice smiley doctors would I want to go to for my prostate problem? And would I have a choice? How, what would I know about them? Where could I find that information? <coughs> the answer is, it's actually probably not that easy to do. And most of us just go local. And we would do that on the basis of the reputation <coughs> and of word of mouth of the people in the area. If that the GP and that GP's practice <coughs> decided that I needed something done to my prostate, I needed an operation on it, um, you have the right to choose which hospital you're referred to by your GP. And actually, you can go to any hospital in the country uh, that offers the suitable treatment within the NHS standards and costs. Um, uh, in practice, it, it doesn't usually work quite like that because the GP you see is probably constrained a little bit by what's available to them on the screens that they work with by the CCG. Uh, if you are making a choice, the NHS Choices website, which we'll introduce you to in a minute, gives you some advice. And this is what that advice is. You should think about any treatment uh, that could follow on from your GP's referral. And um, your choice of hospital may be based largely on convenience, such as how far away the hospital is, waiting times, and parking facilities. But if you need an operation, um, you might want to look up things like clinical ratings, infection and mortality rates, um, which can vary, as you've just heard. And you should choose your hospital according to what's most important to you. Now, what this isn't really the most helpful advice, I think. Uh, because how do you know what's important in the context of a disease when you're very stressed? 
It's quite a difficult thing to do. And you're bound to need advice. Your GP is just supposed to share that advice with you and to use NHS choices to be able to make some decisions. Now let's go back to uh, uh, my questions, if I can do that. So I've just, we've just answered that one. I'm sure you'll answer 100%. So where would you get the information and what's important to you? And this is really an interesting question. Let's see what of these features you can tick as many as you want. Which ones are important to you? <coughs> Margaret Thatcher, remember, was interested in the quality of the food and what choices you had. Nice, you're all alive. <coughs> One of the surprising things is this. Another question in this one. I'll come back to that one in a minute. A little survey was done about what people thought um, was most important in their choice of hospital. 64% of people voting in 2007 thought geographical location and ease of access was important, and only 17% were interested in the quality of care, and 8% in the quality of staff. Sorry, Barbara. But this is really a surprise to me. And how would those 17%, where would they find the information that they might uh, need in order to use that opportunity to choose? Well. Ari Darzi, about 15 years ago, suggested that there were three domains of quality that you should look for in a hospital. How safe it was, what your experience was going to be like there, and how effective the treatment was. Is the treatment good or bad, and what are the outcomes? I think I'd add another one now, which is efficiency, because I don't want to be hanging around for my treatment. I want everything to work. If you're going to use choice, in order to differentiate between institutions and to change the quality that they improve, we need to have a think about how each partner in this, the patient, the GP, and the provider, are affected by uh, choice and what it means to them. So if we look at the patient's uh, interests, um, you need to have the ability to choose and be know, know that you can. You have to want to choose, which you did at the beginning of this talk, you have to be offered a choice. You have to think that quality is important, which only 17% of people seem to do. And you have, access to, you have to have access to enough information to be able to make that choice. The GP, on the other hand, has to also believe that choice for the patient is important, offer it to the patient, get involved in the decision making, and use similar or better information in order to help them, and that takes time. At my end of the business, at the provider end of the business, we've got to understand that we are actually competing for something. Now, that's quite hard when we're full all the time. And we've got to understand that patients' views and the signals they're sending out make a difference to us. We've got to be able to analyze and understand the meaning of those choices and respond to how the market moves and get ready for the fact that we might have to shut down if you all want to go somewhere else. Only 60% of people in a recent survey um, said they'd been offered a choice for their secondary care by GPs. Now, it's a survey, so we can't, don't know whether that would work prospectively. But nonetheless, it's not as high as I thought it would be. <clears throat> and there are significant risks, as you heard, from going to the wrong place. This is a very recent one. It's not from the UK. It's from Philadelphia. This is St. Christopher's Hospital in Philadelphia, which is a, has a pediatric cardiac unit like mine. And this is their current death rate in, for newborn babies in that hospital. It's three times the hospital down the street, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. We want to know, were the parents offered a choice in that town between those two institutions? I happen to know not because their insurance companies were providing the choice. And what would they have chosen if they had known those information? 
that information? Where would you have taken your baby? So there is this feeling that you need the right information at the right time in order to make intelligent choices. And we have an asymmetry of information. We, as doctors in the healthcare system, know more than you do. Uh, and we have to think about where you can find that information. Um, and we are recommended to use something called NHS choices, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and um, uh, this doesn't project very well, so we'll move on and show you how you might get from your GP into a hospital. The Choose and Book program was an electronic way of being referred by a GP which came in during the Blair government. And this is now transitioned to e-referral, which is an electronic system where you can select various characteristics of the people you want to treat you and then um, make a booking. But you still have to know quite a lot to be able to advise your GP or work with your GP what they want to fill in in those various boxes. So let's consider how easy it is to make those choices and where you might get that information. I'm just going to escape again and go back to our quiz and ask you where you would look for information to help you choose um, a secondary provider for your prostate problem. Google takes quite a few of you, um, as interestingly, and the GP, less than a quarter. So for our chap with his prostate trouble, where are they going to look? Well, if you go to um, NHS Choices, I'm hoping this will just link us straight to the website. This is what NHS Choices looks like and you can um, enter a search term into the box, and you can look for local services, put in your postcode, and identify uh, what to do. Or, if you know a little bit more about it, you might want to go and find all the consultants near where I live offering urology, and pick one of them out, and find out what you can find about them to do with urology, which is to where, where my prostate is, and oh dear, no performance data available for this consultant, as there aren't for any of the consultants on that page. <coughs> what I really want to know, I can't find, which is how much experience they've had in that operation, what mortality there is, whether I'm going to be incontinent, impotent, and how long I'm going to be in hospital. And I can't find any of that information at all from any of these sites. In fact, NHS choices traffic, only 2% is used to find and compare institutions, and 63% is used to learn about your disease. So if your doctor tells you you've got prostate trouble, you'll go there to learn about it, but not to choose where to go to. So it seems. And it takes me to a friend of mine who I send out these uh, essays to, to be reviewed around the world, and um, sadly he needed some prostate surgery. And um, this is what he wrote back from a different country. He went to his first specialist based on reputation, like a lot of doctors do. It was a disaster. His second one was based on urgency, because he needed an appointment quickly, not because he had urgency, which is a urological symptom. <laughs> that was a disaster. In the end, he gave up and just left it to his GP, and everything worked fine. And he did very well. The choice that he thought he was exercising was overcome by frustration with the system. And we'll come back to that in a little while. Maybe a prostate takes us into realms where it's quite difficult because not everybody who needs their prostate done is um, young enough to know how the smartphone works or to get onto a, a computer or even have access to the internet. Um, whereas if you tear your uh, knee ligaments skiing or playing rugby, you might have more luck. So you could again go and look up knee ligament surgery and learn an awful lot about knee ligament surgery. Quite a good website, actually. But if you want to go and find out who does knees um, and how good they are, I looked up 
uh, a lot of people offering services near where I live with knee problems, and let's just pick out one. If I go down to look at, um, sorry, I've gone back there, made a mistake. Let's go back to knee. This doctor specializes in the knee, and all I can find about him is knee replacement. Very good data about knee replacement, but nothing about my knee ligament. That doesn't mean this is bad, because there was nothing there before, and now there is something about knee replacement, and the orthopedic surgeons do a really good job in telling us about that. But not everything is there, and common things are common. You tear your knee ligament quite commonly, you have a prostate problem quite commonly, but you can't find any of the information you need. And yet looking for information actually can be quite good for you. This is the, uh, a letter I got from a mother of a patient of mine who needed a heart operation who's also read, read the essay. When her child was diagnosed, it's obvious that it was terrible. But when she started searching for surgeons, she felt more involved. Um, and th this I find interesting, that even in cardiac surgery, where we know there's plenty of data around, it's very hard to find anything of value about individual surgeons because no one medical would express a view, and those who expressed a view weren't medical. Um, they just wanted the operation done, and um, I kept banging on about how important the team was, which I tend to do. Um, and only afterwards um, did she realize quite how important the team became. But there was no way of finding out those, that information beforehand and no way of me being able to help her search for information that she needed other than to offer her reassurance. Now, um, there is a big issue here of capacity. Uh, most NHS hospitals, as you read in the paper every day, are full. And most, those of you who are medical directors will know that that's most of your life, is trying to find beds for people. So here are two hospitals, and they both have the same proportion of knee surgery in each of them. Red is knee surgery. You have decided to exercise your choice and have your knee surgery in hospital two. That means they're shortly going to do more knee surgery in hospital two and less in hospital one. And you would hope that the money associated with your knee surgery would move uh, with you and that hospital two would get a bit more money for treating you, treat you well. And if lots and lots of you in the audience decided to go to hospital two because they were quite good, then you'd hope that that hospital would get bigger and be able to cope with more knees, with the consequence that hospital one might have to become a bit smaller. Now, those of you who've been around long enough in the NHS will know that that's pretty tough. The uh, politicians and local communities, local councils, do not like hospitals <coughs> getting smaller or shrinking or moving or closing. It doesn't work. You could argue, though, that the other hospital that's got a referral practice, which is moving away to hospital two, should start to get better. And this is where the concept of patient choice exercising some importance in quality could come in and change the behavior of hospital one and change the people that it's hiring and make the knee surgery better. I, I'm not very good at remembering things. I have to put a question mark for when I have to go to the other place. Had you ever heard of NHS choices? Have you ever heard of my NHS? My NHS is um, a beta version of a patient feedback website, which allows you to look on the website for ratings of hospitals, if it's St. George's, for example, and you can find <laughs> starred scorings down the right-hand side, and um, if you go to read all the 40, 489 reviews, you can get uh, much more detailed uh, reviews and answers from, uh, and answers from the um, 
hospital itself. So you can read uh, star ratings and reviews. Um, but most of you didn't know it existed. I think this is a very um, good point to um, reintroduce Neil, whose field and sphere of interest is getting the information from you that could maybe change the behavior of Hospital One. So Neil, if I can hand back to you. Um, I have to declare, uh, I don't call it a conflict of interest or just an interest and a passion, because after uh, some, nearly 20 years as an NHS nef nephrologist, a kidney doctor, uh, eight years ago I founded an organisation called I Want Great Care, and the aim of I Want Great Care is really simple. It's to make it very, very easy for every patient, every family member to rate and review their care. Uh, it is interesting to think that more people review their washing machine than their paediatric surgeon. Literally, on Amazon, more people review their venous flytrap than the oncologist who's treating their child. And this struck me as sort of a bit of an odd thing. So um, the aim, of course, how can we make it really simple? Because we've seen, we've hinted at already the power of, of exerting patient choice, what this might do. And I'm going to come on and mention some of the evidence that shows that the uh, experience, the ratings of patients can be a very powerful predictor of quality. The idea, of course, is that every single rating re and review that a patient makes is shared on an open public website, which is transparent. So that when you do have to make the choice of the GP, when you do have to look for a surgeon, you can find the experiences of hundreds or thousands of other patients like you who've made that journey and, and use their experience so that you can have more information about who cares for you, who operates on your child, who will manage your mother's Alzheimer's disease. The approach, perhaps not surprisingly, has been called the trip advisor of health. On I Want Great Care, we have three million reviews, but there's still a lot of work to be done if the aim is to be realized. NHS choices, patient opinion, allow patients to feedback on their hospital or their GP practice. We've taken a little bit Further, enabling people to give feedback on their individual doctor, surgeon, dentist, physio, nurse, and for all those reviews to be available to the public. Initially, you might not be surprised to hear that some doctors were, I wouldn't quite say violently, but strongly opposed to this concept. How, how dare, some of the words eight years ago, how dare patients write about us? They're lucky to have us. What do patients know? Surely it's about the clinical outcomes. Um, however, you will be very pleased to know that over the last eight years, there has been a huge shift in the opinion of the medical profession, partly, I think, to more women coming into the profession, um, and a realisation that transparency, openness, sharing information can benefit not just the patient, but also the doctor, and for clinicians to get regular feedback from their patients to tell them when they did well, when they messed up, when they communicated well, when their empathy was appreciated, can be very powerful. And indeed, the General Medical Council for Doctors and the UKCC for Nurses have now made feedback from patients a mandatory part of revalidation. Doctors and nurses have to get feedback from their patients and they have to show that they listen. So the aim is that based on personal ratings and reviews, you can generate qualitative and quantitative data to help patients compare one with the other to find the sort of GP they think they prefer. Some people like a GP in a three-piece suit, three suit and a bow tie. Others like their GP to be in shorts and sandals. Which one would you prefer and how would you find them? Or also, I think it's not unreasonable that people expect to have a little bit of a better understanding of the neurosurgeon who's about to put his hands in their brain. <coughs> Tens of thousands of patients are searching and reading reviews every month. We just saw how Google is probably now taking over from your GP about the best place for information. And it's interesting that often when people go to Google, the next thing they do is read ratings and reviews from patients like them, families who've made that journey and can help them understand. However, to be really effective, such an approach requires that huge numbers of patients, you could say most patients, rate and review their care. And these things are not there yet. Looking into other sectors, it took TripAdvisor nearly 12 years 
before they had the volume of reviews of hotels that made it pretty much a standard site for people traveling overseas for the first time. Um, we think we're still five or six years away from delivering these sort of things in healthcare. But looking at the rate of increase, uh, the adoption of internet across all ages and generations, it's clear that the concept of searching the internet, reading ratings and reviews is here to stay. Many NHS hospitals have thousands of reviews. Some even have 80,000, 90,000 reviews, where for others, there's a mere handful. It's very much a, a work in progress. And it could well become a useful tool for patients and a useful tool for doctors and surgeons to understand when they get it right. But why do so many people think this is so important? Well, more and more research is now being done both in the UK and in the US, that actually shows ratings and reviews from patients are more than just nice for doctors to hear. They're more than just useful to help you make the choice. Ratings and reviews from patients can predict safety and quality. We've already seen how hard it is to find information to guide rational decisions. For example, a large study done from UCLA in the States showed that hospitals that patients gave a five-star rating to, so just a simple star rating, were far more likely to have better survival rates, lower risk of infection, and to deliver a better experience. So actually looking at the clinical outcomes, the quality and the safety, can be predicted by what you and other patients like you say about the hospital. Um, in the UK, work done in Imperial College, again showed that ratings, reviews, Assessments from patients can predict risk of infection. They can predict mortality. So what we're finding now, that if this approach is, is done properly, it has the potential to perhaps be a smoke detector of safety, to help us know when an organisation is beginning to fail before deaths increase. It may be profoundly common sense, and everyone's thinking we're stating the obvious, but it's interesting to relate that it was actually patients and families who really blew the whistle in Mid-Staffordshire. It was the voices of families that really added credibility. People know what's going on in their local hospital. You're sitting at the bottom of a bed for four hours waiting for your relative to come back. You see an awful lot. But it is interesting to now see the data supports the concept that if you get patient opinion done properly, if you get feedback properly, it can predict safety and allow us perhaps to prevent some of the tragedies that have happened in the past. Of course, to see this information coming through, to see these studies from both sides of the Atlantic, make it perhaps more frustrating that communication systems in the NHS often make it harder for patients to provide feedback on their care. As you're probably aware, you're more likely to get a, a text or an email message from your airline or your bank or even your hairdresser asking for feedback than you are from your surgeon or your hospital. The vast majority of NHS communications with patients is still by letter. And of course, to make these things really work, it needs to be easy. A click on a link to provide the feedback. Interestingly, whether it's in paediatrics, in maternity, in palliative care, those organisations that do get this right, that make it easy for their patients, the children, the families to provide feedback, do get very high response rates and can use this to improve the services they offer. As I say, it's been presumed, usually by doctors, not by patients, that the patients themselves have difficulty judging the quality of the service. As I've suggested, the evidence suggests the reverse is true. There was one particularly large study done by Professor Doyle in Imperial College. He reviewed 55 studies, the world's largest studies and the highest quality ones, looking at the correlation between patient experience and care quality. His conclusion was, patient experience is positively associated with clinical effectiveness and patient safety. Clinicians should resist sidelining patient experience as too subjective or mood-orientated, divorced from the real clinical work of measuring safety and effectiveness, and listen more to patients. As I say, there's a lot more work to be done there's a, uh, in this area, but it is interesting that we're beginning to see the approach taken in so many other 
um, areas of society and so many other markets is revealing that actually maybe the doctor doesn't always know best and it should be ask me, I'm a patient. Martin. <laughs> I'm here as well to tell you that there are a few dangers with feedback because people like us, doctors and hospitals, can cheat. And we have to be aware that um, systems that provide feedback have to be policed. Um, both people have been, hospital trusts and GPs have been fiddling the system a little bit onto NHS choices. And I think it's important that um, systems uh, like I Want Great Care, which have very good policing, um, don't let this happen. So I was giving a um, lecture last year in Manchester, and there was a man there called David Flum, who's a surgeon in Seattle, and he said this, it constantly amazes me that patients will drive past a hospital with the best results to get to a doctor who smiles. <laughs> and I showed this slide at a previous um, Gresham lecture, that how you'd be successful in private practice, <laughs> be available, be affable, and be able, but in that order. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the affability is very important. Um, patients know this. There was a survey done in 2007 looking at what was most important for patients in their care. And I won't ask you to read it. Seven of these were related to communication and three to hygiene. Nothing about outcomes. And for choice of hospital or choice of admission dates, they ranked 74th. Out of, uh, uh, and 76 out of 80 categories, <laughs> much to everybody's surprise. So what you as patients seem to want is a bit different from what th we think we're providing sometimes. The King's Fund repeated the study in a different way, searching Google for what matters to patients and came up with very similar uh, characteristic features of what um, looks nice for a doctor. Where do you find all this stuff? How do you find doctors with these characteristics if you're trying to choose your GP or your hospital? NHS sites, not very good as we've seen. Social media, maybe. Societies, or are we going to fall back on word of mouth, which on the whole doesn't work too badly for this sort of thing. There is an asymmetry of information between doctors and nurses. Now, it's not really surprising. The doctor on the left has spent 20 or 30 years learning her trade. And so she knows more than him, unsurprisingly. She's also got the white coat and the clipboard and a power haircut and the stethoscope, which gives her huge advantages. <coughs> it's not unreasonable for her to know more than the other person. But now that person, that man, can go and so seek the same information from the same places that we do. Google and PubMed are open access. And we publish our, our papers and our journals increasingly in places where you can read them. We're not separate from each other in the way that we used to be. That power gradient has changed. And, um, but we haven't yet got uh, to a situation where the information that we present is understandable. It remains very easy to misinterpret, and it's very hard for you as a reader to get insight from those scientific papers, papers unless you've seen enough. I've shown you before how we present results from cardiac surgery, but unless you're trained in interpreting funnel plots um, of various kinds or uh, Vlad charts, what the hell do they mean? They, you have to have a significant amount of understanding of how these data are presented to make them worth being there. So we've got lots of work to do to change the way in which you present data. Doctors have power based on their expert knowledge. And uh, if we were uh, exercising that power exchange in a different way in a pub, having a conversation between two people, the, that gradient of power doesn't exist. We would share knowledge between ourselves rather than impose knowledge on the other person. And this has been well expressed by this chap, Main, who's a vet, actually, who was very fed up with the way his wife was treated in hospital. He wrote a good article in the BMJ where he said, well, it would be better if we treated our patients as if they were our friends and build and lose, rather, that power relationship which we've built up over many years. This um, uh, media-friendly doctor in America who uh, speaks a little bit like Sarah Palin um, uh, said this, and although it's very American and very Palin-esque, I think it's, it says it rather beautifully. Um, they want the you that treats patients like family. 
And I think that when people are voting for what they want out of a doctor, as we've seen, those compassion, empathetic, uh, soft parts that you uh, we're talking about are more important to many people than the quality of service and so on. I think that what we should be talking about is shared decision-making. And so does a lot of the NHS. This paper was published in 2012. No decision about me without me. Shared care, where you involve your GP or your doctor in your management, is really popular with patients. It takes time, unfortunately, more than one meeting. But those people who are engaged with it are more likely to commit to their treatment, to turn up, and uh, to take their medications. And they're more satisfied with their care. You can have too much choice and choice overload, over choice. And a book's been published called The Tyranny of Choice. I think this is best expressed in a graph. This is from a marketing textbook. If you don't have very much choice, you're not very happy. If you have too much choice, you're not very happy. And there's some middle area where you're reasonably happy. And somehow, by sharing care and sharing those decisions, you get closer to that middle area. We get patients who tell us, do, just do what you think's best. So if I respond to that, am I being paternalistic or responsive? I've been criticized for both over my career. 65% of patients in Chicago in hospitals preferred the doctors to make the final decisions for them, much to my surprise. And doctors increasingly pass the burden of decision-making on to the family as part of this choice agenda there's an, un, um, an unintended consequence, which would make it tougher for the families. And I sent the text to Peter Lawson in uh, Toronto to read, and this is what he wrote back. My God, this happens every day. We're training a cadre of physicians who provide options but never want to make a decision. So we talked about doctors, hospitals, and outcomes. What else should we consider? And I'm going to um, just uh, invite my um, friend Parker Moss who is a Great Ormond Street parent um, of a child. And this is the child, Vanessa. And um, I'm going to ask just Parker a couple of questions because we want to expose something else in the last few minutes of the talk, which is, um, Parker, can you tell us a little bit about the pathway of care that Vanessa was on when she was in hospital? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Martin. I think I've been chosen because my daughter has been on a very complex and long pathway. So Vanessa has, as she's seven today, she has stage four neuroblastoma. Uh, we were inpatients in your hospital for 17 months, and during that time, she's had bone marrow transplant, chemotherapy, multiple major surgeries, some of them by yourself, Martin, um, antibody therapy, immunotherapy, total body radiotherapy, the works. And, uh, and we were treated across four acute four, well, three acute hospitals, a community hospital, and uh, we've been... <laughs> You know, many months in ICU. So very, I think I, I represent well the, the category of very complex um, pathways. And, and uh, from my certain knowledge, you're one of the most active searchers of the medical literature to try and yeah. find out I mean, I think what it, it is. But what, in the course of this, do you think you found out all you needed to find out, or was there stuff in retrospect that you wish you could have found out in advance? Okay, so on that question, I was never offered a choice of oncologists. So we were assigned the kind of the, the oncologists on the roster, and in fact, that she went off on maternity leave, and I was assigned a second choice of oncologists. Nor, nor did I have much data on either the outcomes um, of those oncologists or, or um, really the survival rates of the institution. But really, on reflection, I've thought about this quite hard. Um, both of the oncologists that I was assigned were very different to each other, but absolutely terrific. And I've got to know the oncology team, all of the oncologists at Great Ormond Street and actually at the other UK hospitals. And so if I were to have been given that choice um, of individual doctor, if I had been given information on outcomes, I don't think it would have either affected my morale or, in fact, the outcome for my daughter. Um, on reflection, and th this has come from now you know, 42 months of treatment, um, the things that would have mattered to me to have made a choice is really about the quality of the pathway, the quality, the efficiency of the pathway, and the integration of the pathway across all of those institutions. So the kind of things I would have liked to have had information on, and I say this, I guess, from the perspective of an expert patient, uh, are things like can my community provider get access to pathology or drug data in real time, and do I have access to that data? Um, 
it, uh, does the Share Care Hospital um, have access for my febrile neutropenic daughter in the middle of the night direct to the ward, or do I have to queue up um, through A&E during flu season? Um, is an MDT available uh, that does it extend beyond oncology to include surgery and radiotherapy? Uh, it's really, I think, a quality, uh, it, those are the kind of things that I would have wanted to have rated my care based on. And if, if I could have had a choice of oncology care with hindsight, that's what would have really mattered to me. And I think that's what would have mattered to patients um, that have complex pathways, which of course in includes the huge burden of elderly, frail and elderly comorbid patients with long-term conditions. Parker, thank you. Thank you. That's about the process and our pathways and how different bits of the system work together to manage one individual patient. It's not about a doctor or a hospital. It's about how we work together that's important. And one of the things that Parker said when we were discussing this earlier, he said it's no good having an A doctor in a B system. That can be very harmful. I hope we've shown you this evening that patient choice is more complex than it first seems. But I believe, um, and I hope we've shown you tonight, that you're, you can make your voice count. There are lots of ways that that's about to happen and beginning to happen, and I think you should do that. Peter Lawson, again, um, said he puts his trust in the systems of care, rather like uh, we've just heard from Parker, never in the hands of one person, and we should reflect, communicate, and question. It's, it's never failed him or his family, um, but he doesn't know what best is anymore, and I feel very close to that at the end of this talk myself. Remember, just to finish, if you're not happy, you have the right to and should demand a second opinion. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.